The next section is over mole ratios, and a mole ratio is just the ratio between the numbers of moles of any two substances in a balanced chemical equation. So I'm going to switch my pen color just to keep it straight. And so this says balance the following equation and then determine all mole ratios. If I balanced this one, what would my coefficients be? If you need a second. What'd you get? One, three, two. Do we agree? Two, two, six, six. Good. So if these are my coefficients, what we're doing with a mole ratio is we are basically just relating any two things that are in my chemical equation. You can relate two reactants to one another, you can relate two products to one another, um, you can relate a reactant to a product, product to reactant, it does not matter. It just depends on the way that it's being asked. So for example, for every one mole of N2 that I use up, so every one mole of nitrogen gas that's used, I'm going to produce two moles of NH3. So all I did was use the numbers from my coefficients and then write them into what we're calling a mole ratio. I can also write this the other way by saying that for every two moles of NH3 that I produced, I needed to use up one mole of N2. It does not matter how you write it, so you have the flexibility to put it into whatever order you want based on how the equation or based on how the question is worded. So my question to you is for every one mole of nitrogen gas that we use, how many moles of hydrogen gas did we also need to use? I'm going to ask it again. For every one mole of nitrogen gas that we used, how many moles of hydrogen gas did we need to use? Three. Three. So the ratio just comes from the coefficients. If it seems super straightforward and easy, it's because this part is. That's it. So I'm just making them up, like asking random questions about this. So you'll have actual context to it where there's a specific thing that you're looking for. Um, if I wanted to produce two moles of NH3, how many moles of hydrogen gas would you need? Three. Because again, that came from my coefficient. It will always be in this ratio. Let's move on to the next one, see if we can apply it to another equation. So here we have two reactants and two products. Has anyone balanced this one already? All right, what you got? Three, four, one, four. Do we agree? Yes. All right, three, four, one, four is my balanced chemical equation. Remember that if you balance it and you have higher coefficients, you can reduce them. So if you had six, eight, two, and eight, that would still balance your equation, but this is not the lowest ratio, so you would need to reduce them all by two before actually using them for your mole ratios. So what this is telling us is that for every three moles of iron, that I use up, how many moles of hydrogen gas did I produce? Four. Okay, for every four moles of H2O that I used up, how many moles of H2 were produced? Four. You guys are looking at me like, it's too simple. Okay. Don't worry, it gets harder. Uh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Just for you. All right, do we have questions on this part at all? We're good to move on? If you find this part difficult, chances are you're overthinking it. So all we did was pull the coefficients. So what I wanted you to see was that you can relate any two reactants to one another, you can relate any two products to one another, you can relate a reactant to a product, you can relate a different product to a reactant, it does not matter as long as you're using the coefficients every single time. So what we're going to do with this is you'll have questions like this one. 
says, if you dropped 0 0.040 moles of potassium into a beaker of water, how many moles of hydrogen gas would you produce? When you have word problems like this, which you often will have word problems, you need to identify first what it is that you're looking for and what is your given information. So in this case, this is my given or your known information. And what you are looking for is the other part that I underlined, how many moles of hydrogen gas. So if you identify what you're looking for correctly, then you should know at the end, your final answer should say something moles of what? H2. H2. And how did you know it's going to be H2? Hydrogen gas, hydrogen, hydrogen is Perfect, because it says hydrogen gas and hydrogen is diatomic, so you know that it's going to be H2 and not just H. So then we have to write our balanced chemical equation. The information that we have is that I put potassium, which is K, into a beaker of water. So K plus H2O. I know that I am producing what? H2. H2, but that's not my entire product. There must be something else because otherwise where did my potassium and my oxygen go. So this is one of the cases where it's actually helpful to have water not written as H2O but as HOH. You don't have to change it on yours if you don't want to, but I tend to like it that way. And if you're looking at this, potassium has a plus one charge, hydrogen has a plus one charge, and hydroxide has a negative one charge. And then if you're looking at your periodic table on the activity series, potassium is way up here. So it is way, way more reactive than hydrogen, which means that in a single replacement reaction, potassium would be able to replace hydrogen. So potassium would come in and take hydrogen's place, kicking hydrogen out, which is what we have here. And then what would my other product be? Perfect. So potassium hydroxide. So starting with your correct skeleton equation, meaning we have the right reactants and products, and then we just need to balance it. Having it written as HOH also helps here, where if I have two hydrogens, I know I'm going to want two hydrogens on this side, so a coefficient of two. Two times one gives me two on that side. Two times one hydroxide, so I need two hydroxides as well, and then that changes my potassium, so I need a coefficient of two there. So I didn't need a coefficient here, and I don't have to write it since I wrote this equation out myself and there's no line in front of it to fill in, but if this one did have a coefficient, what would it be? Good. And then I think you guys in your notes don't have a lot of room to write this one. If you need more space, you can write it up in this area, but I thought ahead and gave myself more space. So it says start with your known and use dimensional analysis with the correct mole ratio from the balanced equation to find the unknown. So my known information that's given is 0 0.040. So 0 0.040 moles of potassium. And then you're going to draw your line. Remember this process? And then I drilled this into your head during first semester, so hopefully we kind of dust the cobwebs off and it starts to become familiar again really quickly. If I have moles of potassium up here, what do I need to do with it? Disco it down. I bring it diagonal down, but why? So that it cancels out. Perfect. So I have moles of potassium up here. I'm going to bring moles of potassium down to the bottom. And then you can go to moles of any other substance. So just like when we were writing mole ratios up here on page one, I was just randomly selecting moles of one thing to moles of another thing in the equation. It does not matter what you choose um, when you're just writing random mole ratios. However, in this case, we have a specific goal in mind. So what we're looking for, our final answer, is we're looking for something in moles of hydrogen. So I'm going to go from moles of potassium, so I'm going to go from here, moles of potassium, into moles of hydrogen. So I'm going to put moles of hydrogen up top. 
So the conversion between any two things in a balanced chemical equation is going to be called the mole ratio. So we use those ratios to help us out. And just like we did on the previous page, we just take our coefficients. So I have two moles of potassium for every one mole of H2. Make sense? And then to solve this, I would just multiply everything on top, divide by everything on bottom. You don't have to type a 1 into your calculator because multiplying or dividing by 1 is going to keep your answer the exact same. So 0 0.040 times 1, but again, you don't have to type that, divided by 2. And what does your calculator say? 0 0.02. Two, and your unit on that, since moles of potassium cancels out here and it cancels out here, your unit is just moles of H2. But remember that fun little thing called significant figures? But there's only one significant figure. I mean, the, the, the least amount of significant figures. So remember, when we are doing conversions, which is what this process really is, when you are converting something, you are going to make your significant figures match whatever you started with. So you're going to match the sig figs of your given or your known information. So in this case, my given is 0 0.040. Do you remember your sig fig rules? You want to review them? You don't want to review? All right, so this one has how many sig figs? Two, so my final answer needs how many sig figs? How many does it have currently? Perfect. So I need to add a zero to the end to make it two significant figures. So dead babies are bad. Wait, were dead babies in this? Yes, dead baby zero is the zero up here. We call it the dead baby zero because if you leave that off and you just wrote point zero two zero, I may or may not see that little decimal. So put your zero. That is never significant. Your leading zeros, whether they're before or after the decimal, are not significant ever. So it's not going to change your sig figs. What? When they're trailing zeros. Yes. Good? No, so remember, he just said he remembers his sig fig rules, and here we are. All right, let's review them real quick. I'm going to zoom in a lot so that I have space to write on here. You all can use whatever you need. So first, if you have a non-zero digit, What's the rule? Significant, sometimes, always, never. Always significant. Okay. What about, so there's three types, three ways that we can describe our zero. Our zero can be a leading zero, meaning it's in front of your non-zero digit, so leading. Leading zero, it can be a trailing zero, meaning it's at the end of the number. Or it can be a trapped zero. So, if you have a leading zero, is it sometimes, always, or never significant? Never significant. So I'm going to write this one in red. Never. All right, what about a trailing zero? Sometimes, Sometimes significant when? If it's after decimal. No. It is Say that again? So let me give you some examples. Oops. If I have. 1.0. Is that zero significant? Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to give it a little check mark. Yes, yes. Two sig figs in that one. What about 10? No. no. What about, so that's not significant. What about 10.0? Is this significant? This last one? Yes. Is this significant? Yes. Is this significant? Yes. So trailing zeros. We've got it on record. It's not what you just said. Trailing zeros can be significant even when they are not behind the decimal 
because if there is a decimal in the number, trailing zeros become significant. So if I had 10 with the decimal right here, it looks funky, but what that decimal does is it makes that zero significant. That zero is still not behind the decimal. So it is about how you phrase it. Zeros after the decimal, yes, will always be significant, but also some zeros before the decimal can become significant when they are, when there is a decimal in the number. Make sense? Do you see the difference? Okay. So they are not significant if there is no decimal. So the, the sometimes is when there is a decimal present. And then a trapped zero. Is that sometimes, always, or never significant? Always. Always. So always, always for non-zero and trapped. The other way you can think of your um, trailing zeros is that it would be tr like a, de a decimal is significant. And so when it gets trapped, like but if you have the 10 with this, your zero is trapped between a significant figure and a decimal. So you can kind of classify that as multiple different things. Good? All right, let's move on to the next example. So it says, using the same number of moles of potassium, how many moles of H2O will be used? So if I have the same number, that means I'm using the same given as in this question, which was given to us up here. So 0 0.040 moles of potassium is going to be my starting information. That's why I told you all right up here. So if you put this one under where it says example two, oh, so yours is squished together. Like your step two and example two, there's not room to write in between it. So then when I did this one, I said write it up here because I gave myself space, but I didn't give you space. Sorry. But that's fine. Squeeze it on there somewhere. So if I have moles of potassium, if that is my given information, I automatically know I'm going to bring my unit down, just the unit, because the goal is to cancel out your units. But if I brought the number down, that would cancel the number. And I don't want to cancel the number. I want to change the number. I want to convert it. And we are going to convert this into moles of hydrogen, H2. Sorry, not H2O. That's one. So moles of H2O, according to my equation, if I have two moles of potassium, how many moles of H2O did I use? Two. So my ratio, my mole ratio, is two to two. So if I have the same thing on top as I do on bottom, that two is going to cancel out with that two, which means I don't even need to plug this into my calculator. What is my final answer? Perfect. I want to remind you all how I grade this. Um, I know a lot of you could probably look at this and see, okay, the ratio is the same. So if I have this many moles of potassium, I'm going to have that same number of moles of water. I understand that you have the logic to figure that out. But don't forget that when I grade these, you get a point for each number and a point for each unit in every single box. So number, unit, number, unit, number, unit, number, unit. So if you looked at this and you could solve it logically and you say, yes, they have the same number of moles in my chemical equation. So if I start with this many moles of potassium, I'm going to have that many moles of, hydro or of water. That is true. And I will still give you your point for the right number and a point for the right unit if you use it. But that is two out of eight possible points in this question. It is the process that I want you to learn. So make sure that you're showing your work every single step of the way. Make sense? Okay, let's go to example three. So example three says, one disadvantage of burning propane, C3H8, is that carbon dioxide is produced as a product. The released carbon dioxide increases the growing concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. How many moles of CO2 are produced when 10.45 moles of C3H8 is burned in a propane gas grill? The grammar's maybe a little sketchy. It might say R, I don't know. 
So first, I need to start with my balanced chemical equation. You can't get anywhere in here if you don't have an equation to represent the reaction that's taking place. So first, I'm going to take C3H8, and if it's burning, what does that mean is happening in the reaction? Perfect, adding oxygen. And what it's producing, it gives us one of the products, which is gonna be carbon dioxide, CO2. I'm gonna give myself space to put a coefficient. Plus, what else? Water, H2O. So then we need to balance our equation. I'll give you pink. We balanced this exact equation a lot of times before, so if the numbers start to look familiar, it's because you've practiced it. I'm going to start with a 3 in front of carbon. 3 times 1 carbon gives me 3 on that side. 3 times 2 oxygen to 6 plus the 1 is 7. Then I'm going to go ahead and make my 8 hydrogens. So 4 right here. 4 times 2 gives me 8 hydrogens. 4 times 1 is 4 plus the 6, so I have 10. So I just need a coefficient of what right here? Perfect. And then this coefficient will be a 1. You don't necessarily have to write that yourself, but you should know that it's a 1 if you were ever to use it um, as a mole ratio. Then the question is asking us, if I start with 10.45 moles of C3H8, I'm going to put that 10.45. Put that right there. Already, even if you do not understand what the next step is, you can earn yourself two points because I have this and this. That is two points just by setting it up that way and showing me that you understand you're going to be using this process. You can earn yourself a third point by bringing down your unit that you know you're going to do every single time. So moles of C3H8 would come down here. That is already three points and I haven't really even looked at the question yet. Then once you look at the question, you'll be able to tell me it's going to be something in what unit? What are we looking for? CO2. What CO2 though? Moles of CO2. So since this is what the question is asking for, I know my final answer should say something moles of CO2. If you can set your question up this way, you would get one, two, three, four points without even having to really think about it. That's half credit. And then from moles of C3H8, where can I go? Uh, there's one mole of C3H8 because it was a Good, we follow that? Excellent. So what we did was we multiplied 10.45 times 3. We didn't have to type in the 1 because the 1 is not going to change our answer whether I'm multiplying or dividing by it. We used our mole ratio from our balanced chemical equation to write this. So I have 1 mole of C3H8 for every 3 moles of CO2. And that is my answer. And then as far as sig figs, I have one, two, three, four significant figures here and one, two, three, four significant figures here. So we're good. Picking up where we stopped a minute ago, it says the reaction between methane, CH4, and sulfur produces carbon disulfide, which is CS2 a liquid used in the production of cellophane. So when you balance this, a two, one, two, and four. Is that what y'all got? Yeah. Yes, okay. So balance the equation is step one. Calculate the moles of CS2 produced when 1.78 moles of S8 is consumed. So if I start with 1.78 moles of S8, then I bring moles of S8 to the bottom. I do that so that the moles of S8 will cancel out. And then what will I try to go to? What unit would go on top? 
Perfect. Moles of CS2. So the whole reason that we did this little section on page one, going back and forth between all these different mole ratios, is to show you that you can write a mole ratio for anything that's in your balanced chemical equation. This tends to be where students get lost, is they don't know where to go next after they bring down their units. So I did that to show you, you can go anywhere, really. So you just try to make it be somewhere that's going to help you solve your equation or solve the question. And then the ratio between CS2 and S8 comes from my coefficients. So I have two moles of CS2 for every one mole of S8. And then to solve this, I would just multiply 1.78 times 2. What is that? Do we agree? Is that what everybody got? And then your unit is moles of CS2. As far as significant figures, this has one, two, three sig figs, and so does that, so we are good. All right, letter C says, how many moles of H2S are produced during the same reaction? If it says same reaction, what that means is that you have the same given information. So our same given means that I'm starting with 1.78 moles of S8. I would bring moles of S8 down again. And then this time, I'm looking for moles of H2S, so I'd put moles H2S at the top. Between moles of S8 and moles of H2S, my mole ratio comes from the coefficients. So a 4 would go right here. And then moles of S8, I'm just 1. So 1.78 times 4. Do we agree? Moles of H2S. All right, how are we feeling with just converting moles of one thing into moles of another thing? We're good? Yes? Are we ready to ramp it up a little bit? Well, you need to know how to do something else for your homework. Oh, okay. We're not going to call it quits. We're not quitters. All right, keep going. Are there any questions on this before we move on? Nothing? Your pros? Yeah. Okay. Yes. The key is balancing it correctly. So just like in our previous units, it kind of starts to ramp up quickly where if you didn't know how to crisscross to make a formula for something, then when we got to nomenclature and then you had to name that thing, really hard. Then when we get to chemical reactions and you have to put that thing into an equation, really hard. Then if you can't write those formulas and you can't get the names, you can't write the equation correctly, you're not going to be able to balance it correctly. So it all builds on itself. You see how that's happening now? I've like said it probably every single time you've walked into this classroom, that it's going to spiral. Okay. Next, so we already talked about molar mass on here. We are going into mole to mass conversions. This is when you're starting with something in moles and converting it to mass, which is in our case going to be measured in grams. All right, y'all ready? So example one says, determine the mass of NaCl produced when 1.25 moles of chlorine gas reacts with sodium. This kind of equation is something that you can probably balance in your head. What coefficients do you get? 2, 2. 2, 1, 2. Good. 2, then 1, then 2. You don't have to write the 1 if you don't want to, but just recognize that there's a 1 there. So step 1, done. Step two, start with your known, your given information, and use dimensional analysis with the correct mole ratio and the molar mass of the needed substance to find your unknown. So in this case, what is my given information? What is my known? OK, 
Okay, so write that, 1.25 moles of Cl2, chlorine gas. It has a 2 on it because chlorine is diatomic. And we can also tell that it would be Cl2 because this is obviously not chlorine gas. This says chlorine and has a little G, so it tells me it's a gas, and that's NaCl, not chlorine gas. So use your equation to help you. If I have moles of Cl2 up here, where else do I automatically need to put it? Good, diagonal down, so moles of Cl2. This is asking us to determine the mass of NaCl. I just said up here that mass is going to be in grams. So if I'm looking for the mass of NaCl, that means that my final answer should say something grams of NaCl. The reason that I had put the molar mass review on this page is to remind you that molar mass is going to be the ratio that we use to get between grams and moles. So if you need to go from grams to moles, or moles to grams, that's why I wrote it that way, moles to grams, what you're going to use is molar mass, but it's important to remember that it is for that specific substance, so you cannot go from moles of one thing into grams of another. You can only go from moles of something into grams of that same exact thing. Meaning, there is no such thing as going from moles of Cl2 into grams of NaCl. Don't write this because you can't go from moles of this into grams of that. I can, however, go from moles of chlorine into what? Good, moles of NaCl. So you have to take a little pit stop to get to moles first because what I have that relates the moles of this to the moles of that is my balanced chemical equation. Then I would bring my moles of NaCl to the bottom and now I can go to grams of NaCl. So between moles of one thing and moles of another thing, that's where we're using the mole ratio that comes from the coefficients in your balanced chemical equation. So for every one mole of Cl2, because that's my coefficient here, how many moles of NaCl did I produce? Two. Two. And then if I move on to this section, these are no longer going to use the coefficients. Grams per mole of the same substance is talking about molar mass. So that's here. Units are grams per mole. We usually will write it as either grams over one mole or one mole over a number of grams. Do not forget that it is always one mole. Every single time, it's going to be one mole. It does not say use the coefficient. So when I'm here, grams to moles, I'm doing molar mass, which means next to where it says moles of NaCl, what am I going to write? One, because it is molar mass. Even though the coefficient says two, we only use that coefficient when writing the mole ratio, comparing moles of one substance to another. But here, grams to moles is talking about molar mass of NaCl, so it's just one mole, because the periodic table is in one mole quantities. So I would take the molar mass of sodium, which is 22.990, and I would add to that the molar mass of chlorine, which is 35.45. So 35.45 plus 22.990. There are no additional subscripts, so this means that my molar mass is 58.44. Is that what you got? Okay. So that number is the number of grams that are in one mole of NaCl. And then I would multiply that number by 2, and then multiply it by 1.25. Remember, do not round this number. So how many grams of NaCl did you get? Perfect. 146.1. But then I need to match the significant figures. This has 1.25, so that's 1, 2, 3 sig figs. This should also have three sig figs. How would I make that number have three? Just be 146.
Good? All right, the next example says, determine the mass of sodium needed to complete the same reaction. So if it's the same reaction, that tells me same given information. So I'm going to use, again, 1.25 moles of Cl2. I'm going to bring moles of Cl2 to the bottom. I'm going to keep my line going. I keep making it too short. And I know way at the end, what is the unit going to be on my final answer? Grams of what? Good. I can go from moles of Cl2 into moles of the substance that I'm looking for. So I'm going to go to moles of sodium, moles of Na. Do I need to put a 2 on it? How come chlorine had a 2 and sodium doesn't? Because chlorine is diatomic and sodium is not. Good. Moles of sodium can come down to the bottom. And then using my equation, I have what, need, what I need for the mole ratio. And then from moles of sodium, you can put grams of sodium at the top. So for every one mole of Cl2, how many moles of sodium? Na? Two. And then between grams and moles, for every one mole of sodium, I know that it's going to be one because grams to moles of my same substance is molar mass. The number of grams comes from my periodic table, so that is going to be the 22.990. So 22.990 times 1.25 times 2. I multiply everything that's on top. You can get numbers that are not 1 on the bottom. That is always possible. Um, in this case, it just happens to be 1s. So if you start with 1.25 moles of chlorine, how many grams of sodium are you able to produce? Or sorry, how many did you use? 50 what? 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 57.475. And this one still has three sig figs, so I need my final answer to have three sig figs. So how would you write this? Perfect. 57.5. So 5. 7.5 grams. Good? All right, last bit we're going to do is mass to mass conversions. You have to convert to moles every single time. And when you do mass to mass, this means that you're going to start with something given in grams instead of being given in moles. You need to then convert. So what it's going to look like is, I'll write it in purple. You're going to start with something given to you in grams. So in this case, I have 25.0 grams of ammonium nitrate. You need to convert grams of your given substance into moles of your given substance. From moles of your given substance, you can convert that into moles of substance 2. And then you can go from moles of substance 2 into grams of substance 2. So between grams and moles of your first thing, that's going to be molar mass of your starting substance. So this is molar mass. And then between moles and grams here, that's also going to be molar mass. But between moles and moles, that's where you use your coefficients from your balanced chemical equation. So that's the mole ratio. I do have a whole video already posted on what we call the mole map that kind of describes this. I put it in a different format. So if this is how you think about things, like if seeing it drawn out step by step like that helps you, um, you can check that video out. So first, start with your known, or balance your equation before anything. One, one, two. We agree with that? Perfect. So then after you have your balanced equation, start with your known, and then use dimensional analysis. And this kind of describes what I just laid out up here. So first, my known, or my given information in this case, is 25.0 grams of ammonium nitrate. So 25.0 grams of NH4 
NO3. Draw your line. It's probably going to be long because you have a lot of steps. If you have grams of NH4NO3, I can't go anywhere from grams except into moles of that same substance. So if the question is asking about a different substance, you're going to need to convert to moles first. So grams of NH4NO3. The only place that you can go from grams is to what? Of the same exact substance. Perfect. So moles of NH4NO3. I'm going to change colors now. So then from moles of NH4NO3, I should have made it match these colors, but oh well. Moles NH4NO3, then I can go into what? Moles of, you say H2O? Yes, because that is what we're looking for, the mass of H2O. That is my mole ratio. Then you use another color, green. I'm going to bring moles of H2O to the bottom. This one does match. match. So moles of H2O. And then once you have moles of H2O, so again, every time I take grams, that number, or that same unit goes down. This is moles of NH4NO3, that goes down. Moles of H2O, that goes down. We do that every time so that it ends up canceling out. Moles of H2O can go to what? Grams H2O, using the molar mass every time.